Hey everyone, this is Gati. Welcome back to my tech channel. I know I have been inactive for such a long duration, but now I will try to post content on regular basis. And if you don't want to miss any updates of my channel, then do subscribe and press the bell icon to be notified of my new videos. So as you all know, this is the sixth part of this interview questions and answers series. So without any further ado, let's get started. Question number 76. Numbers of local notification limit. The maximum number of scheduled notifications is 64. If you have reached the maximum, you can't add more local notifications without removing the old ones or after firing the scheduled notifications. Each application on a device is limited to the soonest firing 64 scheduled local notifications and discards the rest. One important thing is that the recurring notifications will be considered as one. Next question, push notification sound limit. Custom sounds must be under 30 seconds when played. If a custom sound is more than that limit, the default system sound is played instead. Question number 78, what is P8 file? So this is one of the unique questions I came across in my interview and at that time I was also not aware of it. So let's see the answer. Sometimes you might not even able to export the required P12 file due to loss of key or mixed up development or production environment certificate and unable to send push notification to test flight or app store. Worst case, push notification certificates typically expires in one year and you have to renew it in Apple Developer Center and re-upload the new certificate to your push provider every year. If you have five apps, then you have to do this process five times every year. Fortunately, Apple acknowledges the pain of generating push certificate and in 2016 WWDC, they introduced a new authentication format for sending push notification. The new format is a P8 key file. It works for all your apps. One key file can send push notification to all of your apps, works in both development and production environment, no need to switch between certificates and best of all, it doesn't expire. Isn't it great? Things needed to be provided for the backend developers to send push notifications are P8 file downloaded from Apple Developer Console, then package bundle identifier of your app uh, like com.datadog.push notification in my case, the key ID of the P8 file, and team ID, the team ID of your Apple Developer account, which is available at the mentioned website. Next question, question number 79, how push notification works? This is also one of the favorite questions of interviewers. So process is as follow. You have to register for the push notification. So the app will register for the push notification. Device will send the request to APNS server and send back the device token to the device. Once the device has a device token, the app will send the device token to your server. Your server needs to implement some code which will send push notifications. Server should always have P12 file. Now here uh, you can choose either P12 or P8 as per your preference. P12 is actually a APNS certificate. In order to send valid push notification, you should always have P12 file at your server. Once you receive device token from your app, you send a push notification request to the APNS server and the push notification sent from your server would be in the form of payload. Once the APNS server has the payload, it will send notification to your device. Question number 80. How is the notification delivered to the device when it is not connected to the internet service? Nice question. So notification will be delivered when internet connection on iPhone becomes available again. But how? So Apple push notification service includes a default quality of service component that performs a store and forward function. In APNS attempts to deliver a notification but the device is offline, the quality of service stores the notification. It retains only one notification per application on a device. The last notification received from a provider for that application. When the offline device later reconnects, the quality of service forwards the stored notification to the device. The quality of service retains a notification for a limited period before deleting it. 
Question number 81, how to pass data between view controllers? Interesting question. So there are multiple ways of doing this. First is by using an instance property from controller A to controller B. Then by using segu with storyboots. Third one is by using instance properties and functions from view controller B to A. Fourth is by using the delegation pattern. Fifth is by using a closure or completion handler. And last one is by using notification center and the observer pattern. Question number 82, types of dispatch queues. There are two types of dispatch queues. One is serial queue and another one is concurrent queue. Now serial queue execute one task at a time in the sequential order and concurrent queue execute one or more tasks concurrently. Question number 83, key value coding and key value observing, KVC and KVO. So what is key value coding? It accessing a property or value using a string. And what is key value observing? So that means it observe changes to a property or value. Question number 84, what is delegate and notification? So delegate creates the relationship between the objects. It is one-to-one -one communication. A delegate uses protocols and creates a has a relationship between the two classes. One of the other benefits of delegates is that you can return something back to the owning class. Now let's see notification. So notifications on the other hand are more geared towards point to multipoint communication. These are used if an object wants to notify other objects of an event. An example of using an NS notification might be in a tab, tab bar controller application where you may need to notify multiple view controllers of a particular event so they can refresh data, etc. Question number 85, how many ways constraints can create programmatically? I have faced this question in my interview, so I thought to include it. So you have three choices when it comes to programmatically creating constraints. One is layout anchors, second NS layout constraint class, and third visual format language. Question number 86, difference between core data and SQLite. This is also one of the favorite questions of interviewers. There is a huge difference between these two. Core data is not a database, it's a framework for managing object graph. Now what is object graph? That is collection of interconnected objects. Core data can use an SQLite database as its persistent store, but it also has support for other persistent store types, including a binary store and an in-memory store. SQLite is a library that implements a lightweight database engine that is incredibly performant and therefore a great fit for embedded systems such as mobile devices. Like many other databases, SQLite stores data and that is what it is good at. The SQLite website claims it's the most used database in the world. Let's see some of the important differences. First, let's see SQLite have data constraints feature, operates on data stored on disk, can drop table and edit data without loading them in memory, and it is slow as compared to core data. Now let's see important points of core data. It don't have data constraints, if required, need to implement by business logic, operates on in-memory, data needs to be loaded from disk to memory, need to load entire data if we need to drop table or update. Fast in terms of record creation, saving them may be time consuming. Question number 87, difference between keychain and user defaults. A keychain is an encrypted container that holds passwords for multiple applications and secure services. Apple INC uses keychains as password management system in macOS and iOS. Whereas NS user defaults provides a way for application behavior customization based on user preferences. An interface to the user's default database where you store key value pairs persistently across invocations of your app on a given device. Let's understand it by an example. In Keychain, 
if the user removes the app from the device, the saved username and password still remains there. Whereas in user defaults, if the user removes the app from the device, the saved username and password also gets removed. Question number 88. How can you define a base class in Swift? So any class that doesn't inherit from another class is known as a base class. Swift classes don't inherit from a universal base class. Classes you define without specifying a superclass automatically becomes base classes for you to build upon. Question number 89. Access specifiers or access modifiers in Swift. So below are the list of access specifiers. First, uh, let's see common features of open and public. So it can be accessed from their modules, entities, and modules, entities that imports the defining module. Now open classes and class members can be subclassed and overridden within and outside the defining module, whereas public classes and class members can be subclassed and overridden within the defining module. Now internal, this is the default access specifier whatever variable or properties or functions or class you are referring internal means it can be used in the module only. Important note if you don't specify any access specifiers it becomes internal because it's a default behavior. Now file private and private what is common in it can only be accessed in a limited scope where you define them. Now file private restrict the use of entity in its defining source file whereas private restrict the use of entity in its enclosing declaration. Very important information for your interview. Last question, question number 90. Why is Swift known as protocol oriented programming? So it can conform to multiple protocols. It can be used by not only class but structures and enumeration too. It prefers to use value type instead of reference type. So this was all about 15 interview questions. If you will follow the entire series, I'm pretty sure that it is going to help you in your interview. I'll see you guys in my next video. And yes, of course, before leaving, if you found this content helpful, then like it and share it with your friends and colleagues. Bye bye.